Peacock Angel by E.S. Drower being some account of votaries of a secret cult and their sanctuary. And we, we see this correction between the one group and the other group and that sort of thing. Um, I, I see it more like there's different sects and there's personal myths and stuff between families and individuals that differences may arise. Chapter 7 is the Monastery on the Rock. By the guidance of some one of the immortals, hast thou come hither, stranger, Theocritus, Edel, 25. That's where that quote's from. I, I don't know how related that is. Uh, you know, you think they could maybe quote some other source. Like the black book or something as, as a header. On the Friday morning, when I looked at storm clouds gathering, I decided to make that day a long planned pilgrimage, this time to a Christian and not a Yazidi saint, before heavy rain should make the road impassable. Go to the place, I said to Mikael, see if they can find us a car to take to Mar Mate. I left him to it, for Sa'ivre Gant had arrived, full of importance, to take me to see a newly delivered mother, not a Yazidi, she said apologetically, but a Muslim. I followed her through the, uh, the narrow alleys, uh, through the narrow alleys, of the village until we arrived at a yard full of mess and dung or fowl scratched and a ragged dog barked at us and was shouted quiet i went down some mud steps into the cellar where the woman who had just been delivered lay on the floor with a cotton quilt spread over her she greeted me and tried to rise till i restrained her the baby a small chrysalis its head bandaged and bound, and its eye rims blackened with antimony, was sleeping beside her. Eggs and Laban and thin Kurdish bread were brought so that the visit might have no evil effect. So I ate, uttered many mashallahs to keep off the evil eye, and then began to excuse myself. I am going to the dyer of Mar Mate, and I will ask a blessing on you and your child. And the woman smiled for the saint is honored by Muslimin. And when I slipped some silver into the baby's clothing, they thanked Allah for my gift. As I left, Mother Gamp showed me the afterbirth put carefully aside in a petroleum tin. She lifted it out, wrapped it in a scrap of white woolen cloth, ran a threaded needle into the folds, and told me that she would bury it later. Where, I asked. Outside the village, she replied. Um, the Yazidi prefer the house precincts to bury that. But I don't know about the about a, any Muslim rule about burying the uh, When I returned, a rickety ford stood before our door, and the driver, a sad-faced man called Aziz, awaited me. For thirty shillings he would take us there and back. I had heard that the journey of the monastery was a bare hour, and as taxis are usually cheap, I murmured at the price. But the road is bad. The police intervened anxiously, for they had doubtless arranged matters previously. Khatun, Aziz, has just paid sixty pounds for his car. So into the ford we got, Mikael, delighted because he was going on pilgrimage to a celebrated shrine, Jadon because Marmate is invoked by the Yazidis as well as Christians, and a Kurdish policeman who begged that he might come too, for he was desirous of the baraka or blessings that results from a visit to a holy place. The road was but a track through cornfields and flowers which passed over stream and ditch, following the line of foothills until it reached the Akra Highway. After that, it turned left towards the mountains and became steadily worse in places it seemed likely that the ford might 
smash a spring or fall on its side, but Aziz managed to keep it going with a melancholy pride in its acrobatic feats. A particularly vicious spot was just below a village called Bitter Bannock, where lorries laden with marble from the quarries had worn a deep hole in the road. There and in other places, we preferred to get out and walk rather than endure the violent jolting to our spines. At Beer Bannock, there is a beer well, a round deep pond covered thickly with green scum. In winter, the villagers drink from a mountain stream which crosses the road beside it, but in summer, they subsist on the apparently unwholesome beer. Soon, the car descended towards a valley in which two villages, Merge and Mugara, were to be seen beneath us, each a nest of brown, flat-roofed houses. Both these villages are Christian. Near Merge, we passed a girl dressed in wedding garments, so joyous that I regret still not having stopped to take her photograph. The Mukhtar of Merge addressed us from his housetop in hospitable tones, begging us to enter and refresh ourselves, but wishing to press on. We thanked him and promised to visit him on our return. Here we left Aziz in his car and set off on foot towards the monastery. Set high up against the face of the rock, it was a full hour's climb by the steep winding mule's path cut in the rock, in places almost a stairway. Twice we paused to rest and regained our breath, once by an oak tree to which the boat of rags were tied. We axed of a Kurdish girl stepping lightly down the path, what the tree was called, and she replied that it was named Patal Lassia, as once a woman named Lassia had been murdered at its foot. A little above the tree, a ruined aqueduct, chiseled in the living rock, had served to bring water from a broken cistern above, and close by was a small olive grove on a jutting shelf. As we toiled up the last stretch of rock, a small black-clad figure, wearing a monkish cap, came smiling down to meet us, bearing a pitcher and a glass, and poured me out a drink of clear, cold water. The boy aged, perhaps twelve, was a novice in the monastery school. We passed a ruined gate, for the present monastery occupies a smaller place than the ancient dyer. And according to the Mutran, the resident bishop, twelve thousand monks were once housed on the rock, and in the refractory, three hundred sat to eat at a time. Allowing for exaggeration, it is evident that it has seen far more spacious times, since today it shelters but 25 monks in all, together with a few boy novices climbing various steps and stairways. We were taken at once to Mutran's cell, a falcon's nest of a room, hung as it were in space above the blue champagne beneath. His Holiness, a handsome old man with a patriarchal white beard, sat upon the floor, looking magnificent in his black robe over a scarlet and purple cassock or underdress. A large golden cross hanging from his neck. Coffee was served, first the thick, sweet Turkish brew, and then the clean-tasting bitter Arab, while the Mutron conversed with his guests. He asked, how fared the war? He had seen much trouble and persecution, he said, and recalled that during the Armenian massacres, monks had murdered. Uh, monks had been murdered on the mere score of being Christians. He talked of recent earthquakes and floods in Turkey. He considered them, he said somberly, a delayed judgment of God upon the wickedness. I protested in vain. The Turks are now our allies, and these poor people who have suffered in the earthquake are not the Turks who slew the Armenians, but simple village folk. But ancient wrongs lay heavy on his soul, and he repeated sonorously, fire came from heaven and destroyed them. 
the earth shook and the floods came. The wheels of the Lord's vengeance turned slowly. The children paid for the sins of the fathers. It was as if one listened to a minor prophet and I abandoned the dispute. Um, I don't know, was the guy quoting the Bible? Leave the Bible quote if you know it, right? We were entrusted to a tall young monk with a lively black eye by name Rahab the Ud, that is Monk David. The lower courtyards of vast extent are used for sheep, goats, and pack animals, and a combined odor of goat and mule hangs about the whole place. We went constantly up and down by steps and roof terraces. The place is perched on all levels and has an unpremeditated, haphazard effect caused by the fact that it has adapted itself to communities of varying size and epoch and adjusted itself to vicissitudes of prosperity. And there is a picture of the Mutron, the dyer of Maramata, and the monk, Daoud. On his right stands in one of those long, loose things. The Mutron wears closer to suit. And the dyer of Maramata. Wearing, his, wearing a Turkish sort of cap, but closer to, um, yeah, very orthodox looking. And there's a picture of a Yazidi mother and daughter. Now the daughter on her right would obviously be a teen because of the difference in height. Because it says women, and I get, yeah, I guess they are. Um, that yeah, she has another half foot to grow or something. But they're dressed much the same. But the daughter has is that hair hanging down or is those decorations? Yeah, she's got more decorations and stuff. We went first into the lower church. And were taken directly into a chapel at the north side of the sanctuary where Mar Mata himself is buried. This saint lived in Sassanian times, and his life and miracles are described in a booklet which Rahab Daoud gave me. The miracles have gone on uninterruptedly till today. Well, if people attribute what happens to their faith in particular and to the, yeah. As long as the tradition continues, you're going to find something. According to the monks, and a pilgrimage to the tomb brings benefit and healing. The inscription in Strangello on a marble slab, replaced in earlier, destroyed during a sack of the place. I noticed that the cross on the inscription is one that recurs repeatedly in the sacred buildings each of the three arms being itself a cross, the Theodolis extremities. The Jacobites do not depict a figure on the cross, nor have the images or pictures in their churches, such being, they say, idolatry. Well, it certainly violates that commandment. Not the idolatry, but the no graven image thing, because the graven image thing is whether or not you worship it. The cross is for them, not so much an image to recall Christ's death as a symbol of life eternal. Other tombs are in the same chapel, one being that of the Johanna Bar Abra of Malta, who was born in 1226 of the Common Era and died in 1268. In the northeast corner of the church, all the mutrons are buried. When a bishop dies, the face of the stone wall is unsealed and the dead prelate taken to the rock chamber below, where he is seated 
amongst his predecessors in full canonicals on a chair or throne. It must be a ghastly session there below of seated skeletons in moldering pomp. Ordinary monks are laid in another and larger rock-cut chamber on the north side of the church. Here Rahab Daoud said, the ground is deep with rusty red dust and crumbling bones, all that is left of dead and gone brethren. There are other rock chambers. One leads to a long tunnel, which communicated with another monastery, that of Brahom, an hour and a half's distance away. Parts of this tunnel are so narrow that a man must needs wriggle through like a snake. But the passage is no longer used, having become blocked by a fall of rock. And the chancel is a fine example of the medieval silversmith's art. In the cover of the, to the Gospels on the lectern, it depicts the crucifixion and the four evangelists. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are not actually the authors of those books of the Bible, but are at least not the ones that the, those books talk about. Because um, John was written in the 90s. The others written in their first versions as soon as, you know, as, as late as 150. But all, uh, you know, 120 to 150 were when the other three were written in the first versions, edited for hundreds of years after. But into the sanctuary itself, we did not go, for none but a monk or Mutron may set foot in. Should a married priest venture inside, said Urham Daoud solemnly, he and his wife would die. Well, we're all going to die. The upper church, partly hewn out of the living rock, and called the Kanasa as Sayyida, is said to be yet older. It is dedicated to Mariam, wife of Mar Shimuni, who, together with her husband and her seven children, were martyred by King Antiochus. Rahab the Ud described the tortures which this family of saints had endured and spoke of the miracles they perform even today. Here the Kurdish policeman chimed in, for although a Muslim, he had witnessed the yearly miracle which takes place at the festival of Mar Shimuni in the church dedicated to him at the village of Karakosh. At the time of the feast, he said, he entered the church, which was packed with people anxious to see the wonder, for at a certain time on one of the church walls appear the shadows of the martyred king, his wife, Queen Mariam, and there are seven children riding on horses, women who desire children or have any other wish, fling their kerchiefs at the holy shadows, and if their vow is accepted, the kerchiefs stick to the wall. I saw this with my own eyes, affirmed the policeman. Uh, could vary what's on the walls or kerchiefs. From this conversation passed to the intercession of saints. Hatun, you are a Protestant, and the Protestants do not believe in the help of saints, said Daoud, informing the others of my sad condition. But we say, it is like this. Say that I have a case in the courts and I wish for a favorable judgment. What do I do? I know that your honor is the wife of the advisor to the Ministry of Justice. And I write to you and I say, speak to the judge, speak to your husband, speak to the advisor so that I may be helped in the matter. I thought of Sitikula and her belief that it was in my power to have her son instantly released from prison. I realized once again how hopeless it is to expect the Western view of these matters, which seems so churlish to be understood of these simple reasoners. No matter to them that such methods may be abused and become the instrument of gross injustice, to these drawbacks they are inert. A kinsman must help his kinsfolk, a friend, a friend, and a patron a suppliant, that is all, and finer aspects trouble them not a whit. Have you the courage to do a little climbing? asked Daoud, in consideration for my gray hairs, but it was hardly worth the uh, hardly worthy of the name. 
first steps, then a little shuffling along a narrow ledge on which herbs and wildflowers grew like a rock garden, and we stood at the highest point of the monastery. There was another church in a cavern higher up on the mountainside, but it meant more climbing and more time, and I abandoned the idea of visiting it. We saw the dairy and a kitchen partly hewn from the rock where women cooks and dairy maids were busy. And then we were taken to see a cavern in which ice cold water dripped perpetually from the roof and glistened on the smooth sides. The Ood also took us to see the library, sadly depleted of its once magnificent store of manuscripts and books, most of which have been either burnt or stolen. He could only show a few parchment manuscripts in the decorative Eastern Syriac character. Although the monks were still fasting, and with the Jacobites, that means entire abstention from all animal products for 50 days, they had prepared for us a collation of curds, fried eggs, unleavened bread, and cream before we left. The Ood showed us his own cell, decorated with a few religious pictures and furnished with a few pious books, and begged me not to forget to send him his photograph. Write down my name, lest you forget. I shall not forget Rahab the Ood Ibn. Sleeman. Now, in the Bible and in the Quran, the fasting is the twelfth. Uh, not, I mean, uh, the ninth month is the fasting. Um, but it's a total fast till sunset. And some people practice Lent and they give up something for forty days. Rahab Daoud Ibn Suleiman clapped his hands, delighted. That's right, for I am David, son of Solomon. My father was called Solomon. So we took our leave and set off downwards. Just as we started, we met the Mukhtar of Marga's brother, and he counseled that we should turn aside to visit a large cavern on the path which leads down to the village of Mugara. We did so and entered a large cave, dripping with water, and an artificially contrived rock chamber, in which there was a shower bath of heavy drops. It was malodorous, and the grassy plateau outside was marred by discarded lettuce leaves, newspaper, and orange peel. The sorry token that a hundred and fifty girls from a government school in Mosul had made an excursion to the monastery the day before. No villagers would have made such a mess. Moreover, luckily, they seldom have paper to leave behind them. Excursion, yeah. One of the things that's becoming more and more common is this littering around sacred sites. I mean, if you're going on pilgrimage, you, you really want to spoil your pilgrimage by, by littering and everything else. I mean, sometimes people don't have a choice, you could say, but, you know. The way down was quick and easy, but we stopped by the sacred oak to tear up a pattern of a dress material, which was luckily in my bag, so that Jadon, the Kurdish policeman, and I were all able to tie votive rags to its twigs. Mikael had gone before to bring the car nearer. Aziz was therefore waiting for us at the foot and drove us in good style to the Mukhtar's house. Our host was a fine, solid man of some sixty years. His son met us in the doorway and took us up to him. In the reception chamber, where he sat smoking his palaun, with the village friends. These were sturdy peasants wearing Kurdish dress, baggy embroidered trousers, bird's nest turbans, and huge multicolored belts into which business-like daggers were thrust. They looked as if a doctor 
would have made a poor living amongst them. And what, one of the things is um, some of the smoking and uh, caffeinated beverages like coffee and stuff like this, some of these groups would have not allowed this in older times, knowing that these things fully uh, existed. Um, maybe not the smoking, but uh, I, I mean, uh, they may not have known that existed, but they would have been, well, there were things that people smoked drug wise that they would have known that tobacco would, would have been off the list, right? Or at least after somebody inhaled enough of the smoke, they would have been like, what is this evil thing, right? With unstinting hand, the Mukhtar had prepared us a sumptuous meal, fresh made bread, sheep's curd, green onions, mounds of rice, and bowls of cream with chenina, curded milk beaten with water, and glasses of tea to drink. All this was the more kindly because every man in the village was fasting, and their mouths must have watered at the meal. The room was roofed with branches of poplar, twigs, leaves, and all. And from the unglazed windows, we gazed over the valley and breathed the herb pungent air. A towel was spread on my lap. Basin and soap were brought that I might cleanse my fingers before eating. And we were urged to fall to. The Mukhtar sat on his bench, hospitably benign, while his son, a handsome lad, plied us with food. On the wall hung a gazelle's head. My son shot it, said the father. He's a good sogman and always brings back plenty of game from the hills. He assured me that he constrained all pilgrims who visited the monastery to come and eat with him. The monastery's guests are mine, he said. Near his house door stood the very emblem of his mountain hospitality, a large tenure, an earthenware bread oven. And upon its side was a cross, both amulet and sign of its owner's faith. And that's the end of that chapter.